We normally hold our annual Women's History Month event down in the reading room of the archives in the main library at the University of Iowa. And I'm actually sorry that we're not all there, but on the other hand, we couldn't have fit so many people in there. So we're very happy to be here and to have you all here. This year, we're focusing on the incredible history of African-American domestic workers in the South who came north to make Iowa their permanent home between the 1920s and 60s. I'm Janet Weaver, the assistant curator of the Iowa Women's Archives. Also here from the IWA are my colleagues, Cara Mason, Anna Tunnicliffe, and Eric Henderson. Where, where is he? There he is. Before we get started, I want to thank the co-sponsors of this event, the University of Iowa Public Policy, the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Iowa, and the Iowa City Public Library. And I especially want to acknowledge the hard work of the staff here at the ICPL in setting up and preparing for this event, the custodial workers, technicians, and librarians. So let's give them a round of applause. In 2018, Catherine Van Warmer contacted the IWA, wondering how best to preserve the audio cassette recordings of oral history interviews that were the basis for the book, The Maid Narratives, Black Domestics and White Families in the Jim Crow South. Without hesitation, I responded that we would be delighted to preserve the stories of these Iowa women. I'm happy to say that all the interviews have now been digitized and preserved for posterity. Our next step will be to arrange for complete transcription of all the interviews and to make them available to researchers through the Iowa Digital Library. Today, we're fortunate to bring together four speakers, two of the co-authors of the Made Narratives, Catherine Van Wormer and Charletta Sutta, with Mrs. Annie Pearl Stevenson, who was interviewed for the book and historian Catherine Stewart. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Dr. Van Warmer was raised in New Orleans and became involved in the civil rights movement while attending the University of North Carolina. She received a PhD in sociology from the University of Georgia and a master's in social work from the University of Tennessee, Nashville. She is Professor Emerita from the Department of Social Work at the University of Northern Iowa, and the author of numerous books and articles related to women in prison and addiction. Living in Waterloo, Iowa, she met many African-American women who had previously worked as cooks, maids, and nannies in the homes of white women in the South, and she recognized the urgency of and importance of preserving their stories. Dr. Charletta <clears throat> Sutta earned a doctorate in education from UNI for, in 2011 and is an early childhood specialist with the Waterloo Community S School District. She grew up in Waterloo, where she was raised by her mother, who had previously worked in domestic service in the South. While completing her dissertation, Dr. Sutta conducted several of the oral history interviews for the Maid Narratives, including an interview with her mother, Annie Pearl Stevenson, who we're very fortunate to have with us today. Mrs. Stevenson was just 15 when she started work as a domestic in Oxford, Mississippi, where she remembers cleaning William Faulkner's home. She was one of the black teenagers who made it through the mobs of violent white protesters to stand in solidarity with James Meredith when he integrated the University of Mississippi. And finally, Dr. Catherine Stewart, professor of history at Cornell College, is currently an Oberman Fellow in residence here at the UI. She is the author of Long Past Slavery, Representing Race in the Federal Writers Project, published in 2016, and is currently working on a book titled The New Maid, African American Women and Domestic Service During the New Deal. Please welcome our speakers.
Well, there I was with all these tapes. I had about 20 of them. And I kept thinking about the stories of the women. Sometimes I wake up at night and think about the stories and hear the voices. I wrote to museums, but I couldn't get any response. And then I wrote to Janet Weger, and I got a wonderful response. And so that's why we have this occasion today. It's really exciting because we can honor these women and they have made history. I think in the future, it'll be more valuable than it even is now. When we did the book, I wanted to get the oldest people we could find in Waterloo because I was in Cedar Falls. Excuse me. <coughs> My grandchildren gave me this. <coughs> <coughs> Um, thank you. I begged them not to get close to me. Uh, <laughs> um, and so what is so special about this is because now the history will be preserved for the future. And I will show you, I'll give you a preview of some of the stories that we have. We have the stories in writing, and there's an advantage in a way to the written word. But there's also an advantage to hearing the voice. And you're going to hear two voices tonight. We have one on tape, and we have Annie Pearl Stevenson, um, who will tell her remarkable story. I believe she was the youngest of the women, probably, who, were, who we interviewed. And I said at the time, well, she's too young. But then <laughs> I found out she has a story. But then I can't speak at the same time. Oh. Okay, I want to go back this way. Um, on the cover, uh, this is Elizabeth Griffith. She was the maid to my grandfather, and she worked in the same family for, uh, I believe, 50 years. This is New Orleans. And these are my cousins on the front cover. She worked for us for a while, uh, but my mother was disorganized. And she quit, and she told her father on her, and then she moved over to my aunt's house, which actually had been my grandfather's house. So she ended up working in the same house for all those years. <clears throat> in a way, she saw all of us as her children, and she gave us the warmest welcome that anybody gave us when we went down there after I had moved away and I would go back to New Orleans. We called her a cook. We didn't call her a maid. She was a Creole cook. She was not a Creole herself. They're descended from the French and Africans. But she learned in one of the finest mansions in the city to do Creole cooking. So her meals were incredible. This is the oldest person. Now, David Jackson, who was the other interviewer along with Charlotta Suddeth, he couldn't be here today. He interviewed her. Her name is Elra Johnson. You can actually get her interview on YouTube. I'm 100 years old when she was interviewed. She stood up to the Ku Klux Klan while her husband hid in the back. She would criticize him, but it wasn't fair because they killed the men. But she, as a woman, stood up to them, and she did have a pistol, she said, but fortunately she didn't pull it out, and then they left after she stared them down. She was the most prominent in the sense of she went to Washington, and she was interviewed by, it was President Kennedy and... Lyndon Johnson, the vice president, about what was happening in Mississippi. She was from Ripley, Mississippi, and a leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. The stories are very uplifting, and you don't feel sad. They might be haunting in a way, but you don't have a sad feeling, except for the story of Irene Williams. 
she was distressed because she said her grandbabies didn't want to hear anything about her early life. They didn't understand why she wasn't that literate or that educated. She wanted them to know, so she was doing this interview. She had been traumatized because her mother worked as what we called a nurse. It was like a nurse maid, they are live in, and she'd be gone for three weeks at a time. And she'd cry and cry. She was raised by her grandmother, as were a lot of the women who we interviewed. But she missed her mother, and her big sisters would say, Mama be back, Mama be back. And, and even today, you could hear the pain in her voice. And one thing she said to David, who was interviewing her, this was in Des Moines, she said, I have so much pain, I wish I could tell you, but it's too painful. I wish I could tell you the whole story, but she tells enough. And there's also a situation involving sexual assault, and even though she didn't tell every detail, it was pretty obvious what happened to her. Now we come to, this is really uplifting. You see Dorothy Weathers smiling in the picture. She also had a diamond ring that was given to her by the White family in Des Moines, Iowa. I, I didn't say much about her in the book because she wasn't from the Deep South. She wasn't from the South at all. She was from Kansas, although some people in Iowa think that it's Southern down there. <laughs> and. Uh, but she came up north and she gave details about working as a domestic servant. And then you can compare the difference because I also had other people we interviewed who worked in the north after they had been in the south and they would tell the difference, which was more like being professional, setting the standards, and the the Women who hired them in the North loved to have the Southern, Southerners. They, you know, they were unspoiled, basically, and they were very, very appreciative. She also said that the ones who were darker complected tended to work in factories or they worked as servants in Des Moines, but the ones who were a fairer, with, of a fairer complexion, they got to work in department stores. And that would have been probably late 1940s or 1950s. So there are a lot of interesting details that come out with these interviews. Hazel Rankin, uh, this is one that makes me laugh when I think of her story. She worked in a house, uh, probably Mississippi, and as was typical there, they had to go in the back door, they couldn't go in the front door, and believe it or not, and you probably heard this, they couldn't use the bathroom. They couldn't use the toilet. And there wasn't one. New Orleans often had a toilet in the back of the house, right? even a separate building. But out there in Mississippi, in rural Mississippi, they didn't have any facilities for, for their servants. And so you read throughout the stories what they had to do. Well. Her sister, the, the people of the house left, and she said that her sister not only used the toilet, but she jumped in the bathtub and she <laughs> gave herself a bath. <laughs> this is the voice you will hear, Annie Victoria Johnson. I think she was probably the least educated of the women and many of these women came up and got college education when they came to Iowa. Some had it already. The one from Arkansas and Louisiana, some of them were well educated already. She wasn't, but she was an incredible storyteller. So let me see how to get this on. Oh no. Yeah, you can help me, huh? I did it at home. There. So 
sound like? What did you see? What do you mean? Like, is the sound okay? Like, is it too loud? Sounds like the deep breath. Like, by the number of feet, number of foot, number of bed. Did they think that we, they sleep in our bed? What did they call your mama? Them white kids. You remember? Some of them would call her grandma. And realize that now my mother was in her thirties then. And they were calling her grandma. Call her grandma or uh, auntie. Did she love them like she loved y'all? Oh know? yeah. She whooped them just like she did us. She whooped them like she whooped yeah. y'all. Yeah. Wow. And the woman would tell her if if they don't mind, you know what to do. Yeah. And it was yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and thank you. And they do that right now down south. Yeah, they do. So now, how, how, what age would the baby be before the white woman would let your mom say babysit or watch the kid? Her to, baby? Yeah, the white baby. My mother would be there when the baby would be born. Is that that something? Help make baby clothes for them. Mm -hmm. Feed them. They breastfed their babies. But as soon as they got six months old, whatever you ate, the baby ate it. But the, who, now the white woman would breastfeed. Yeah, and black folks too. The black folk, the black woman would breastfeed the white baby. Yeah. How did that, how did that work? That's what they call, uh, what you call that? <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, so the, the black woman milk would be there for that white baby. Yeah. Did the black woman have a baby? No. Yeah, they oh. both nursed. Oh, so just, if she, the black <laughs> woman had a baby, she could nurse the white baby. Yeah. Is that something? I got, I'm going to ask you this. She says, um, some people say the white women were kind of helpless in some ways. Did you find this to be true? If they were sickly. Okay. You know, uh, just like some black women be sickly. Okay. Some of them could have babies and some of them couldn't. All right. And maybe the ones that did, would be, it would be something wrong with her. Okay. And the husband would go get a black woman that was breastfeeding to, to feed his baby. Okay. The interviewer was Charletta Sada. I met her as a student in the MSW program. And when I met her, she had the listening skills like you wouldn't believe. And I said, Charlotte, you and I have to get together. I have an idea. That was like a long time ago. And it took us a long time. Um, and this was one of the first interviews. It was the second interview that Charlotte did. She was a little reluctant at first, but you could hear her. She got really into it once she started these interviews. And now you will hear from her. She did interview her mother for the project, and you'll hear her and her mother. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I had laughter and chuckles. And um, again, I'm Charlotta Sutter. And that's been a while ago, and i um, kind of um, nervous a little bit, but I'm also kind of saddened because um, Miss Annie Victoria Johnson is now passed away. And so um, it was just very, very moving to hear her voice again. And so let me just kind of tell you a little bit how I got involved with um, Dr. Van Warmer um, with the project. Um, at the time, she actually asked me for probably eight or nine years. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, m almost closer to 10. And um, at that time, I was working on my second master's, which is in social work. And I had a husband and 
family. And um, I just, I was working and doing the things that, you know, women do. Um, and I just couldn't see um, doing, conducting interviews. And um, all the while as well, um, my mom is here and I grew up, and that part, this part is in my introduction in the book as well. I grew up listening to um, my mom, I, I say in the book, um, I don't know if any of you can remember the story of Miss Jane Pittman that used to come on, thank you for the head nods, that used to come on um, um, when I was a little girl. And my mom would just recant all of her days um, growing up in Oxford, Mississippi. And, you know, hearing her and that history, I really never got the idea that it was important. <laughs> never got the idea that it was important. Um, just listening to her over and over, um, you know, tell me about her stories and then kind of, you know, Shara, you have to be twice as good. You have to do this. You have to do that. And just a funny aside, you know, when I actually got hooded for um, my uh, doctorate, uh, and Dr. Van Warmer, you'll remember this, they asked uh, for me to take a picture. And they said, uh, would you take a picture? And my mom got up straightened out her clothes and posed for the camera and someone had to tell her we were thinking of the candidate. But anyway, <laughs> so um, your history, your history is valuable. And so um, I, I thank her and um, she will talk a little bit about um, her days as a teenage maid. And I think it was her story along with um, my great aunt who is also featured uh, in the book who has, is now deceased. Um, my great aunt took my mom as a teen and had all this information has been triangulated, research based, and they actually cleaned the home of William Faulkner in Oxford, Mississippi. And my great aunt was his cook and she remembered well what he liked to eat, biscuits, um, salt pork, fried salt pork, which would be ham, I believe, and sagram molasses. But anyway, I'm gonna read a couple um, passages out of the book, and then we will um, turn it over to um, my mother. Um, Vanilla Bird from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Interviewer, what kind of rules did they have? That's me, Vanilla. The man didn't want me to wash my hands in the wash pan. They didn't have a sink. They had a wash pan where you'd wash your hands. After that, I didn't wash my hands at all. I would just go in and start cooking. He didn't want me to use the same one that he was using. There were no uniforms and I didn't have to babysit. I did grow up with one of the white kids. We lived on his farm for a while, Lester was his name. We grew up about the same time. I see him sometimes when I go home now. They let us play together, you know, we were just kids until we got among the other white folks, then we were separate. That's the way it was back then. The white folks where I worked learned things from me and I learned things from them. I think the white families learned how to cook from the black workers. I learned a lot of things from the white folks, especially, you know, how to cook different things that they like to eat and that we like to eat as well. When I was working for the folks and cooking, they ate better than we did. They could buy steaks and variety of foods. They ate a lot of steaks and such. I learned how to get ahead and how to keep house better than what I knew growing up as a kid. We made the beds just the same. We cleaned house just the same. You know what? House cleaning is just good old house cleaning. And she laughed. Um, there's another one I'd like to read. Ruthie O'Neill. It was lightning, thundering, and raining one night. I didn't know white folks called black people darkies. That night, she was talking on the phone, and she said, yes, there's nobody here but me and darkie. I thought she was saying, Dorothy. And she kept saying, and darky this, and darky that. And we're doing fine. And darky's doing pretty good. 
I kind of like Darkie. I don't know what kept me from saying, my name isn't Dorothy. <laughs> it's Ruthie. I went home and I was telling my grandmother what she was saying and my auntie. She said, she wasn't saying Dorothy. She was saying Darkie. She said, that's what they call us. I said, why would they call us darkies? And she said, because we're black. And then I think I have one more here that I'd like to share. Yeah. Sorry. Pearlene Sist Jones. I'll just read a little bit about her. I was born in 1918 on Hampton's Place in Taylor, Mississippi. We didn't own our land, but lived on someone else's land. We stayed in an old barn. We had swept and cleaned out, hung some paper up on the walls. We had an old refrigerator, and every time it would turn on, the walls would shake. And my brother Doc would laugh. Our sister Rosie was a baby then. Them were hard times. A white woman up there at the university, talking of old Miss, who was getting her education, a woman getting her education was something. Got us out of there, and we moved to Oxford. The main family I worked for was the Gills. Mr. Gill was so mean. I took care of Eleanor, who was a child, and her mother, Anne. One time, Miss Anne was leaving and had told me not to let Eleanor eat anything before dinner. And she left. Eleanor climbed up on the counter and was getting cookies, and her foot hit me in the face. You know, white folks bought good, hard, stout shoes. <laughs> before I knew anything, and then I'll pause, and you guys have to get the rest. Amen. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Forgive me. I just want to say this before I bring up my mom. You know, I've been thinking about this whole legacy and this thing we call life. And first of all, I want to encourage everyone here to know your history. Seek it from any elder that you can because it's more important than you'll ever know. And before I bring up Annie, I would like to just leave you with this. I believe that the shared bond in the plight of oppression speaks to all women. The narratives of these admirable women have been a great source of strength and encouragement to me. Thank you for this space and time. Now I'm going to bring up my mother, Annie Stevenson. My name is Annie Pearl Sis Stevenson. I was born September the 23rd, 1945, in Taylor, Mississippi. And I have so many experiences. However, it was a funny thing, though. I was the youngest boy. I was the only one in my family that worked as a maid. I'm the middle girl. So I don't know how did my aunt, she just wanted to train me how to do domestic work. My mom had died at that point in time in my life. So I was kind of interested in making money for myself. We, my dad farmed. We farmed on a sharecropping or on a hat. So we had to do the farm work first. And then after that was done, I'd ask my dad if I could go up and live with my aunt. Caroline Jones. And I have to say this because uh, my little granddaughter, she's so cute. 
she's named it for my name's sake. She said, Granny, what you gonna, what you gonna do to kind of to have people to get into the story with you? What are you gonna use just to kind of get a laughter going? And I said, <laughs> I said, Oh my God, I never thought of that. <laughs> she said, Well, just do this, Granny, and do it this way. And I think you'll get the people a laughing, and then you can go ahead with your story. So I thank you for that. She's here today, by the way. <laughs> Kalia Pearl Sutter. I was driving her home from school one day, and she was so interested in what I would say. And I don't even know how to start. I have so many. The bus. The bus. Jane Meredith. I uh, went to Oxford, Mississippi to integrate the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss University. Our parents, we lived in the country, and we were driving up to uh, Oxford. And uh, of course, our parents didn't want us to go. We were young people, young children, well, teenagers. And he said, now, Annie Pearl, do not catch that bus to Oxford because there's going to be trouble up there, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> it went in one year and I'll be up. I couldn't wait to catch the bus. And so, so were the rest of the teenagers. We got on that bus and headed to Oxford. I think it was about a 15-mile drive. And just as we got right into town, they had what they called a square. Oh, I got long arms. I used to play basketball. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, we drove, just before we got to the square of Oxford, Mississippi, a whole bunch of white people. They had billy clubs. They had everything you could think of, and they were going to stop the bus. Well, we had a young man driving it, Mose Lockhart. It sticks in my mind. He was a little older than we were. He probably was like maybe 18. And so uh, he said, you guys hit the deck, and I'm going to keep driving. <laughs> so we did just that. We hit the deck. We fell on the floor, and don't you know, glass was popping. They broke the windows. They broke the glass. They just was bound to stop the bus. But we were bound to get to Ole Miss University because we wanted to be there to support Jane Meredith. And we did. Um, another time, and so many times, I, I think I was out going one in our family. I think I'm the uh, risk taker. That's what they call me, risk taker. I always took risks. So um, let's see what else happened. And, um, oh, um, going to Oxford every Saturday. Oh, yeah, working. <laughs> See, she remember these stories. I'm getting a little bit old on it. I can't remember all of them, but she's right. I used to do maid work for uh, an Italian couple. They were Italian. And uh, <laughs> the man was, to me, huge. But now you got to understand, I was a young girl. So to me, that was big. And uh, he would have us to iron his shirts. And then we'd have to clean the house, make the beds, wash the uh, bathroom and all that. And um, I would get off work. We would work four hours a day. I would get off work, go uptown to the bus station, because my dad, and I mean, my dad don't want me up there. <laughs> he goes, you better not miss that bus. You better come down to Walla Valley, Mississippi. I said, OK, so I would go early. 12 o'clock, I'd be at the bus station. And I would uh, ask the attendant of the bus station. I'd ease up to her, and i said, say, ma'am, I'd like to get a ticket to Water Valley, Mississippi. Will you wait? <laughs> and she started that. Well, I'd give her an hour, maybe two. I'd ease back up. Ma'am, I would like to buy a bus ticket. Don't you rush me. And she'd always use the N-word. Yep. Always. I'd go back and sit down. Now, mind you, our, what we had to wait on the bus was rat infested. We had no chairs. Uh, they had little crates that you sat on. I'd sit back down, and almost when I knew the bus was coming, I would go right back to that same lady. Ma'am, I'd like to get a bus ticket to Water Valley, Mississippi. She said, I told you don't rush me. I said, but the bus is out there. Well, you just wait. So she finally sells me the ticket. When I get to the bus, he's, you know how they do that bus, <laughs> getting ready to take off? 
He's in the N word again. If you're going to ride this bus, you better get on here. By the time I got on that bus, I was sweating. I was tired. But I knew I couldn't miss it because I had to meet my dad in Water Valley. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to go up to Oxford to work. And that was not one Saturday. You would have thought I would have learned. But it was every Saturday. And the uh, next thing that uh, comes to mind, oh, my stepmother, after my mom, I tell you my mom died. My stepmother, she uh, went to Miss Laura's store. And uh, she went to buy groceries. And the store was about a mile and a half from where we lived. And she came back. She said, Aunt Pearl. I said, ma'am. She said, uh, do you know Miss Laura? I asked Miss Laura where was Ann. And she looked at me and she said, Bertha, it's Miss Ann to you. She's 12 years old now. I said, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. So we had to start calling her Miss Ann. We could never refer to her as Ann. Is my time up? Yes, that's your time. Oh, this is my time. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That's OK. <laughs> All right, give her a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Well, talk about a tough act to follow. <laughs> I think we'd uh, much rather have me just jettison my remarks, which I would be happy to do, and actually just just hear more um, of these of these direct stories. And I just have to tell you, I'm. I was introduced earlier, I'm Professor Catherine Stewart, a professor of history at Cornell College, just down the road in Mount Vernon, and I was so thrilled uh, when Janet Weaver very kindly invited me to be part of this panel. Um, this book has been a longtime favorite of mine. Um, it's a favorite book of many of my friends. And when I began my new book project, which is specifically looking at African American women um, and their experience with domestic work in the South, <laughs> sound familiar, um, all of my friends and all of my uh, colleagues said, you must read the made narratives um, because it is such a seminal work. Uh, and the reason for that really is because it has these direct first-hand testimonies um, that are so rich and an invaluable resource uh, for scholars and for future generations to really understand um, what that lived experience was like for people who had it firsthand. So I'm just so appreciative to be on this panel. It's an honor um, to meet uh, these kind of celebrities in my mind. <laughs> um, so I'm really, I'm really happy to be here this evening, um, and I will try to keep my remarks short so that we have a time uh, for question and answer afterwards. I'm sure many of you came here with questions you'd like to ask and, and maybe have questions now that are burning in your mind as a result uh, of hearing these wonderful speakers, um, Catherine Charletta and Mrs. Annie Pearl Stevenson. My current book project, as I said, looks at the experience specifically of African American women um, and domestic service in the South. Um, and one of the kind of burning questions I have as a historian and a scholar is specifically how did African American women working as domestic servants in the private white spaces of Southern households navigate those spaces where they were under the continual scrutiny uh, and we should say surveillance really of their Southern white employers. I really kind of wanted to know what was that experience like for them? Um, what are ways they may have found uh, to kind of assert their own autonomy even within the strictly defined parameters of Jim Crow racial segregation? What are the ways in which they navigated um, both those white neighborhoods and also those Southern white homes? As I mentioned, numerous scholars have kind of really talked about the challenge of finding sources that give direct voice to African American domestic workers, uh, particularly in the decades leading up to the civil rights movement of the post-World War II era. Existing documentation comes largely from outside observers, uh, and scholars have mined those sources, uh, specifically for my time period, the 1930s. Um, sociologists have kind of wrote, wrote about this experience. Um, certainly, we have documentation, quite a bit of it, from Southern white employers about their perspectives on African American workers who were laboring in their households. Um, and certainly, we also have some documentation from investigative journalists in the time period. That's kind of a fascinating aspect as well. And then also um, state and federal authorities. 
But as you can tell from that list, these sources really reflect attitudes and assumptions about the African American women who were working as domestic workers and rarely, if ever, enable those domestic workers and those women to speak for themselves, uh, for the record. So again, this is just really such an important and invaluable source. And I'm excited that um, something that scholars have long awaited, uh, that these full transcripts and the full interviews that were part of this book project will now be made available uh, to scholars and also to the public at large. So um, that's really, really a huge gift uh, in so many ways. And I'm so glad uh, the Iowa Women's Archive was there to receive that gift. Uh, and to take it, to snatch it up. <laughs> um, so the book and oral histories uh, collected from people like Mrs. Stevenson really give us a direct voice and direct insight into the lived experience of domestic workers. I would say that this alone is a powerful act. It helps right the wrongs of history by recording the essential firsthand experience of black women workers on the eve of the post-war movement for civil rights. The labor of black women, especially in the South, has the potential to provide greater understanding on the long historical connection between black labor and black activism and the struggle for civil rights. Domestic workers, as you may know, played a very large role in post-war struggles for social justice, and historians actually often refer to them as the quote-unquote foot soldiers of the civil rights movement uh, in the post-war decades, um, and particularly probably something that's most familiar to you in terms of that intersection uh, between African-American women domestic work and the civil rights movement would be the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955, but there's many, many other examples uh, as we're hearing about today as well. While I was researching my new project, I was excited to discover a rare collection of roughly uh, 90 undergraduate student essays um, from the 1930s that were composed for a sociology course at a private women's college in the South. Um, specifically, they were asked to write on the topic of domestic workers in their own homes. Um, so this is kind of a rare archival find. Um, I was riveted and very interested to see what these um, clearly biased, very often clueless, uh, young Southern white women had to say, coming from a very privileged perspective of class and race, uh, might have to say about the women who were laboring uh, in their own households. As you might imagine, they offer the unique perspective of Southern white women's observations on African American domestic workers in their own households. But I would say that even though they definitely reflect the racial prejudices of the time period, um, and certainly that's also important to document, I'll just as an aside note that one of the things I appreciate so much about kind of the groundbreaking work that was done for the Made Narratives is that it also attempts to document white attitudes about domestic workers uh, within their households. And as I said, while we have official sources on that, again, we miss kind of firsthand testimony um, from many of the Southern whites who had direct um, experience and direct relationships uh, with domestic workers within their own homes. So it's amazing that the Made Narratives also kind of struck new ground or broke new ground in trying to also recapture um, those testimonies and those experiences. If you read the book and you read that section specifically on interviews with Southern whites, um, it's much harder, as you might imagine, um, looking back from a more contemporary perspective uh, to get uh, people to open up freely about kind of racial attitudes and racial biases of the time. Um, and so I was really excited to find these soci sociological undergraduate essays from the 1930s um, that are written, you know, completely uh, openly in many ways in terms of in inhabiting uh, those particular particular racial perspectives. Now, as I said, they certainly document white attitudes, but I was also interested in using and am interested in using these narratives um, for clues into African American women's workers' experiences and clues into how they may have navigated these spaces of white Southern homes. Um, with the help of the made narratives, I was able to examine these essays and kind of read them, if you will, against the grain for evidence of how black domestic workers in the South continued to labor for freedom, using their workplaces to try to carve out a space for themselves while at work on the job, um, to try to carve out a space for their private lives while at work, um, and also their social networks. And if you're interested in kind of some of the things I found um, as a result of that ability to kind of read these narratives and kind of look for them for these types of clues in terms of workers' agency, um, I'd be happy to share that uh, with you afterwards uh, when we have more time for conversation. 
Just briefly, I also wanted to mention that my first book, A Long Past Slavery, Representing Race in the Federal Writers Project, uh, which came out in 2016, um, also has a really interesting intersection and connection to the made narratives. Um, it specifically examines the federal project undertaken during the Great Depression as part of Roosevelt's New Deal administration to record um, the firsthand testimony of the last generation of African Americans who had experienced slavery firsthand. So this is the 1930s, this is a very elderly generation. Um, much like the made narratives, time was of the essence in trying to get these stories down. Um, and it has resulted in the largest collection we have of ex-slave testimony. So it is a rich and invaluable resource. I'm sure many of you are familiar with those WPA, FWP, ex-slave narratives. Um, they're also widely available now, thanks to the Library of Congress, uh, digitizing those and put thing, putting them online. But I was interested to read it again as I was reviewing the book um, in the introduction that Catherine had been inspired actually by this earlier 1930s project to try to get these oral histories and get them down uh, before that generation who had experienced this firsthand passed away um, and that that had motivated her uh, to do this particular project. Um, I was also particularly um, admiring, uh, and I want to emphasize that, of their methodology. Uh, oral history interview is not for the weak of, or faint of heart. It can be challenging in a number of ways. Um, one of the things my first book looks at is the ways in which, unfortunately, that project of the 1930s was complicated, uh, and in some ways you could even argue compromised at times um, because of the lack of sensitivity in thinking about Southern white interviewers asking uh, formerly enslaved African American women about their experiences during enslavement. Um, particularly when actually a number of these southern white interviewers um, were actually directly uh, descendants or direct descendants of uh, formerly enslaved people's former owners. Um, you can imagine how fraught that would be in terms of those conversations. So I so appreciate uh, that this book really addressed that firsthand by exploring a sensitivity and I'd say demonstrating a sensitivity to the very real racial power dynamics that still exist in our society in terms of African American and white Americans being able to speak freely about the topics of race and racial prejudice and ongoing racial inequity uh, in American society. So bravo uh, for the methodology, I so appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to mention just lastly, it's kind of we're meditating on this book and, and opportunities for discussion, um, to think about oral history and what it offers. It certainly shows us fundamentally uh, kind of the hows and the whys of those who went before us. It gives detail in life, if you will, to seemingly everyday experiences. I think in sharing kind of the made narratives and certainly the narratives of the white families who grew up with black women, um, that shows us that in our everyday lives, the things we take for granted are very often those things that perpetuate very dangerous realities, uh, which we should stop and pause and examine. Um, I'm so interested, as are the authors here today, um, and so um, perplexed in some ways by the paradox of the intimacy that was fostered in the Jim Crow racial segregation of the 1930s because of domestic workers working within Southern households. Uh, that's a, certainly a dynamic, as we say, that's riven throughout with power and unequal power in various ways, but it's also one fo that fostered intimacy on a variety of ways, and it is just such a kind of paradoxical moment. Oral history gives us, right, kind of that bird's eye view or that direct window, if you will, into those relationships, what, what they were comprised of and how they played out in individual households. Um, I would also say then it really encourages us to stop and examine our everyday lives and experiences and think about the assumptions that we tend to make about others uh, based upon the work they do, uh, based upon their various identities uh, of gender, class, or race or ethnicity as well. I just wanted to close by saying um, I asked a friend of mine who was so excited. I have so many friends who are excited that I'm here in the room <laughs> with these celebrities. Um, and I actually already have a stack of books that are going to be individually signed for each one of them. So I just wanted to close by um, sharing with you a comment that one of my friends made about this book because she, she started reading it just a few weeks ago, um, not knowing that I had read it and that I was going to be part of this panel. And she said, you have to read this book. You know, I'm so engrossed. It's such a page turner. I've stayed up all night uh, reading it. And I said, you know, please uh, tell me, tell me what, you know, what, what is your take on it? You know, I have a scholarly take on it, but what are you so, you know, compelled by? What do you find so dynamic about this particular book? So I just wanted to close with her remarks. She said, quote, my favorite thing is that it reminds each of us to listen to one another. 
Um, and I think you see kind of the testimony here uh, to the great listening capabilities. Um, and then also the great um, anecdotal storytelling historical sensibility of the interviewee as well. So not just the abilities of the interviewer. She said, my lived experience is different than your lived experience. Two things can be true at the exact same time. Highlighting the oral histories of both the maids and white family employers shows us this in real time and historic time, I would add as well. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be part of this and I know we are eager to hear from all of you. Thank you. have plenty of time for questions, so is the mic working? Okay, so Eric's going to come to you if you have a question and use the mic. The oldest person in my family is 110, so just listening about history is, is just so very important. So how do you, what is one way to preserve this history and to keep this history going to allow people to understand this history and to interpret it as something that everyone needs to know? They will be preserved so people can go there and hear the stories. I think it just to hear the voice of the woman telling what happened, details that are not known. You can't learn from movies like The Help, I have to say. Um, <laughs> um, you have to hear from them, those who were there, exactly what it was like. Mm -hmm. And the stories will be preserved. The problem is to get people to read the books. My kids won't read the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, if, if I could just add a little onto that, I would say you were in the perfect you know, situation and you know, primed really um, to be able to get a wonderful oral history interview yourself. Um, and I think the best oral history interviews um, come from people going back and asking the same questions again or asking different questions in different ways and at different kind of moments. Um, you can get different stories uh, at different moments from the same person uh, who's conveying that history to you. So, wow, right, what a, what a resource to have a family member who's really kind of witnessed uh, so many things themselves. And I would encourage you to get that down on tape. Um, you would be amazed at how even, you know, informal kind of oral history interviews can end up in collections um, and really become the stuff mm -hmm. of the archives uh, that scholars work with and use for many generations to come. Mm -hmm. And then I would just encourage, I think many, many of you are educators out here, I would encourage educators and I would hope uh, that educators, and I'm, I've been part of a couple initiatives to try to do that as well, would really incorporate this into uh, earlier curriculum uh, in terms of primary and secondary education. It's really to use mm -hmm. this type of oral history narrative uh, to really give new light, to give a different uh, narrative about American history and race relations um, than we get from other types of sources. Mm -hmm. So um, I would hope that they do become more widely available and digitizing them is certainly, I'd say, the biggest first step in doing that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation this afternoon. Um, I am curious because it, the, the help was mentioned, um, putting this work into the juxtaposition of popularized history. Um, young people today and probably people somewhat older don't want to work too hard to understand the past. They like to have it presented to them either in a riveting novel or in a film. Is there any opportunity in the future for taking this particular work and presenting it in a documentary form so that people can, frankly, sit and take it in uh, other than reading a scholarly work? Well, I can start the answer to that. The third author, he's actually the second author, is David Jackson. He was in Denver, Colorado. And he told me that the middle school there used the book and they presented it on the stage. 
I don't know exactly, I never found exactly how they did it, but I imagine each person there became somebody here and then told the story. So that, that is one way it could be acted out. I was thinking Hollywood, but we haven't. <laughs> and yeah. um, I'd just like to add, um, sir, thank you for that because that is probably the desire of my heart at this point in time. Um, so many of the um, women that I personally interviewed ha have died. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm very, very fortunate and blessed to have my mother still alive. So um, that is something that I hope comes to, um, to light that we can somehow document um, the participants that are left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. There's a thank whole you. new uh, wonderful generation, or at least I'd say for at least well, longer than just a generation, of African American uh, independent filmmakers who are really beginning to break into the industry and really tell important stories from an entirely different perspective mm -hmm. and stories that directly contest uh, the kind of more popular um, white-centric narratives of American national past uh, that unfortunately people are more familiar with. Um, so. Um, that's an exciting time. I'd say it's an exciting time to be engaging with film in that way. There's a number of wonderful films out there that directly engage with this question of African-American history, experience, testimony, um, and the archives and popular culture. Um, I'd mention Cheryl Dumier's uh, Watermelon Woman, which is a wonderful meditation on kind of the silence in the archives and the importance of oral history interviewing. Um, and then Nate Parker uh, has a wonderful film that came out a few years ago, um, specifically on Nat Turner's uh, rebellion, um, which mm. gives you a very different view of Nat Turner from what was traditionally depicted. Um, it's Nat Turner as a race patriot, as a defender of liberty. Um, and so, so there's a lot of different ways in which I think we can begin to access that. And I think film rights for this <laughs> would be very exciting. Um, so yes, yeah. it would be great. Mm -hmm. They don't have to pay. <laughs> Just get it out there. Any documentary filmmakers in the, in the audience? <laughs> Come up after. Mrs. Stevenson, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about moving to Waterloo and how your life differed in the South and in Waterloo. get a job, and if I could make half of my tuitions, he would pay the rest. And I couldn't get a job that summer. Mm -hmm. So I stayed the next summer, and pretty soon I guess it, actually, then my uh, uncle called me from LA, that's right. He said, I will send you to LA, uh, to UCLA, out in, uh, in California. But I didn't believe him, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't go. Years later, I found out he really wanted to do it. So I wished I had gone. However, I wouldn't have, you know, what I got now. <laughs> so I'm glad I stayed, but that's how I got here. And my sisters, brothers, we all kind of migrated to uh, Waterloo. I think my first relatives mm -hmm. came, the Burts. They came uh, on the railroad, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Railroad. Mm -hmm. They was working on the railroad. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got to Waterloo. Okay. Oh, when I came here? Oh, I have done so many jobs, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> first, when I first came, I believe I worked as a maid. I did. My sister-in-law got me a job as a maid. Then I worked in, does anybody, well, you all are not from Waterloo. But anyway, there's a blacks. Black's clothing store, mm -hmm. department store. Mm -hmm. They had a tea room on the eighth floor. So I got, you all know, probably not all the time, but anyway, I got a job there and I was a little girl. And I mean a little girl, but I got a job washing gray big pots. And I could hardly lift those pots. They were so big, but I worked there. And after that, I believe I went to Dale Farm Food Store, a grocery store. Mm -hmm. After that, I probably thought I could sew clothes. <laughs> so 
I worked at a, uh, a place that they made uniforms for athletes, ball players. Skip to Anime Weems. Oh, yes. That's what you want me to go to Anime well, Weems? Just say, Does anybody know Anime Weems in here? Responsible for There's bringing. There's one. Yes, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Walter Lyle. Yeah, oh. she was a big inspiration in my life. Mm -hmm. After I've had all those other jobs, mm -hmm. she had a course, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they uh, adopted the uh, Hawkeye Community College uh, out of that same that, course. Mm -hmm. And I uh, only paid $5 yeah. to back take then, the course. Back then. Yep, back oh, then, yes. back then. <laughs> and so I uh, learned how to be a cash register yes, operator. Yes. And that's when I found my niche. Yeah. And I worked for the National Bank of Waterloo, mm -hmm. retired from John Deere Community Credit Union. Uh -huh. I retired at age 53. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we're faith-based if you can't already tell. <laughs> and I was so happy, you know, that I was able to have yes. so many different jobs. Uh -huh. I know a lot of people. And let me just say this, because I heard somebody say something about the, uh, what was that one, May, May, what is that? Oh, the hell. Yes. Oh, the hell. Yeah. Uh, they told me what was in it. Oh. And I said to them, we would never have done that where I, we work. No. Because mm -hmm. we love one another. Mm -hmm. Even though we mistreated it, still, you still had respect and mm -hmm. love for people. Mm -hmm. in, in a general, you know, I would never do nothing to harm. She's talking about the blank pot. <laughs> no, I don't want to yeah. tell it. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. I thought that was terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we would have, so that's the difference to me. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the whole film, but everybody I worked mm -hmm. with, we kind of loved one another. And th they were nice. You just had to know what to do and what not to do. That is right. First of all, don't go mm -hmm. to the front door. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't really talk proper. Mm -mm. Did you know that? We couldn't. Mm -hmm. You could not go and say, yes, ma'am. She said, what did you say? Then you'd have to say, yes, yeah, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to read, think things. Because they thought we was, they would say, you're getting too smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uppity. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Uppity. Who said mm -hmm. that? I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uppity, she's right. We got a yeah. question. Yeah. I hear my aunts, and they'd say, when the maid wasn't there, they didn't talk right. this way when the maid was there. I'd say, she's getting so uppity. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, she doesn't know her place. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. I, um, I'm welcome. sitting here with my colleague. I'm actually a, um, in the fellowship program here, um, um, Grant Wood and Fellow in Printmaking. And I'm like 100% sure that Anna V is my great aunt, who I never got to meet. Oh. And I talked to her maybe a year before she passed, oh. and I was gonna come visit because I grew up in foster care, so I oh. never got to actually. So I'm like, I think that's my aunt. I'm 100% sure that's my aunt. I'm like texting my mom, oh. like, yep, that's my aunt. So yeah. I'm just I'm grateful that you guys to, to preserve that history and that I'm in yeah. Iowa and I'm from Chicago originally, and it's yeah, yeah it's my grandmother's sister, so. Yeah, One so thank you. <laughs> and um, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Just because it was given to me to read that one in particular this time. Um, she was one of the first interviews, I believe, that I conducted. And at that time, I was, I was really, really struggling um, to get over the mountain of my dissertation. And um, so many times I wanted to give up, just quite frankly. But um, can I just be myself? Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe that it was just God's will that I met your great aunt. Wow. Um, I was at a time of desperation. And when mm -hmm. I left her house, I got in the car and I began to sob mm -hmm. because I thought to myself, if these women could go through what they went through, still have their joy, who am I? Those women were the wind beneath my wings. And I was able to go on and write more and do everything that I could. Every time I hit a low, I would think about what those women went through 
So thank you for sharing your great art. If we don't have any more questions from the crowd, I actually have a question myself for you. So I know as a black woman doing these interviews, you may have came across like some information that you may have not knew about. Like, was there any like information or story from an interview uh, interviewee that like struck you that you didn't know about, like in your dissertation and in your research that just like really hit you home? Um, my background or my research interest is uh, resiliency. Imagine that, mm -hmm. and so and Dr. Ben Warmer knows that. But I, I think that so. That struck me, first of all, that the resiliency of these women. And then um, I think the one thing that really, really struck me is because sometimes when I would be interviewing the women, I would become angry, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I would be angry at how they were treated, but I was mesmerized at their reaction not one of the interviews that I completed did the women have any animosity, any ill will, anything like that. It was more of a sentiment of that's just the way it was, that was the time and place we were in. And then what I liked, um, I've been on some talks before, um, and what I really think the message here that I got is that love, I mean real love, love can cross color lines. These women had a bond and I think it was based on um, the, the struggles and how each of them had struggles in their own right, but they became to respect each other and just take it for what it was. But I, I was shocked. You know, maybe time heals all wounds, but I would be angry. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be angry, mm -hmm. and they were not. That really affected me, too. Mm -hmm. I was looking for the bitterness, and these are religious women. They obviously sang in the choir, and there was a sense of nostalgia, too, looking back on these small communities in Mississippi and what they had and what they had lost to some extent. And one woman, that was Ruthie O'Neill, who yes. I think is a relative First of you all. When she moved up north of Iowa, she set up yard art. Oh, I hadn't wow. heard of this before, but Ruthie. she had figures yes. in her yard. Yes. Uh, Perfect. To the point that you did, oh gosh, what is going on with yes. this house? Yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and David Jackson was an oral historian. He did his dissertation on yard art, and that's how he got, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. into working with us. And she had, like David said, what's a stick for? That represents the switch that my <laughs> grandmother used yeah. to keep me in line. And yeah. she had all the, you, you've the seen it. The replica of the Taylor Square mm -hmm. and that. But the thing I, this is the thing about Ruthie, her favorite color was, is purple. Oh. I mean, but nowadays people are wearing purple hair, but she was doing that 20 years ago probably. I don't know where she got it. But anyway, I, everything about her house, just so much purple, purple, purple. Mm -hmm. And I, I just happened to ask her, you know, Ruthie, what is all this purple about? And it is actually the color of mustard dime. Have you ever heard of a berry called mustard dime? Yeah, somebody has. Thank you for the hands up. Yeah. And I guess when you, the pigment of that berry is purple, and when she, no crayons, no paint, she would bust that berry open and take and paint rocks when she was a child. And that is how she got to the purple. I'm a product way before your time. It was interesting yeah. watching, listening to you talking about the 40s. 
I'm a product of the 30s <laughs> in the Deep South. First 28 years of my life is in the segregated South, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and realized it was a different life in Tennessee, Chattanooga, mm -hmm. compared to Mississippi. And we learned about that when I was in college mm -hmm. in Atlanta at Morehouse. But I'll talk to some of you more mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that. So I was in another wor world mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. <laughs> sure we don't have any more questions then I do want to ask you all to join me in thanking these remarkable amazing celebrities who've joined us today <laughs>